Good evening. We're going to get started on time. I like to reward people who are prompt. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. Thanks for coming out tonight to our, this is our first lecture of the semester. And we're really pleased to have our colleague Mike O'Hanlon back. And you may recognize Mike from television news shows or recognize his byline in some of the nation's leading papers. Uh, he's also a prolific author, and I, I, I didn't mean to say that with the jealousy that I might have <laughs> expressed there. It's, uh, it's with admiration. We're here to celebrate his latest book, The Future of Land Warfare. Uh, you can grab this from Brookings or Amazon or in softcover, hardcover, Kindle, uh, your local bookstore. We actually get to celebrate it tonight before Brookings actually celebrates it. So uh, we're delighted to have Mike here. Like our, all our visiting scholars, he's, he gets in the UNLV classrooms and meets with faculty and students. Uh, he's an academic himself, as well as uh, working at Brookings as a scholar. He's teaching at Princeton University, uh, as well as other leading universities. So we have no one more qualified to speak on this topic and I know we'll have some questions, so uh, I'll turn it over to Mike so we can get started. Thank you, Bill. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out uh, early in the year, and we're all just getting into the academic spirit, so it's a modest-sized group, but that's good because we'll have plenty of chance to talk. And although I, I gotta tell a quick story, it just reminds me of uh, once I went to the Air Force Academy to give a, a talk, and it was the night of their as it turned out, I, I found this out when I got there, the last football game of the season, home game, same exact time as my talk. And the game had bowl implications. So if they won, they were gonna go to some bowl. So I said to the professor who invited me out, how could you possibly have invited me for the same time as this football game? And he said, oh, don't worry, there'll be students there. And I'm, I said, of course there won't be any students there. And he said, oh yes, there will, we're making them come. <laughs> and so at the Air Force Academy, you can do that. But I appreciate that you didn't have to come and you came anyway, so thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do, as Bill said, is talk about this book, The Future of Land Warfare. And I think to make it more conversational and uh, because we're a small group and just to get into a discussion, the best way I can get at this topic is just to begin with sort of three myths or misperceptions or troublesome trends that led me to want to write the book. And I just want to put them on the table for you. They're essentially what I argue against in the book. And they are increasingly a part of the conventional wisdom in Washington or even official US policy. Now I don't want to, for those of you who are sort of following this debate a little but not in, in every detail, I don't want to worry you too much. So I'm going to slightly melodramatize a couple of the issues because I can see where some of the debates might be headed. I think we're still in plenty of time to stave off or head off the wrong direction that certain forms of thinking, in my judgment, is leading us towards. But um, it's important to have the conversation before people make the mistakes, before the mistakes become really consequential for our security. So I'm going to do it again in terms of three broad myths or misperceptions or even mistakes of policy that are beginning to develop uh, back in the town I come from. By the way, um, one more thing. I left town the exact moment that the Pope was arriving, and I'm going back the same moment that he's departing, so you can draw your own conclusions about why. And, uh, but anyway, um, I, I'm glad to be here in Vegas, uh, even if I had to leave the Pope behind, and, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Bottom line, I don't, I'm not some uber hawk who's saying we need to double or triple or quadruple the size of the army. In fact, I have some friends at other think tanks, uh, Fred Kagan at American Enterprise Institute, for example, who probably would agree with my, a lot of my analysis and say, see O'Hanlon, you've proven why the army needs to grow by a quarter million soldiers instead of just holding steady and not being cut anymore. He said, you get everything right except the bottom line. Uh, he didn't actually say that. I haven't talked to Fred about this, but I have read his own writings. And I suspect that that would be perhaps where he would come out. Uh, and so I'm not trying to make a big dramatic argument about how we need a much bigger army. You may, you may dis disagree with all of my ana analysis or you may agree with some of my scenarios, some of my concerns, and then say that le therefore leads to the case for a bigger army, or you may wind up about where I am. But my main concern is not to see the cuts keep going. 
And let me now turn to myth number one or misperception number one because I think the cuts could keep going. So let me now give you a few statistics, but the, the main point here is myth number one is we can keep cutting the Army because the Army is the least important service in this world of high-tech, cyber, drones, space weapons, commandos and special forces, even though some of them are Army, that's not sort of big Army, that's the specialized Army. So all these newer, uh, glitzier elements of military power are the wave of the future, robotics, etc., and therefore old-fashioned grunts won't be as important. This is sort of myth number one, and therefore in an era of declining defense budgets, the Army can to some extent be the bill payer for the other services as they need money to beef up their modernization uh, plans and to sustain their force structure. So if you want to have a bigger Navy uh, to take on China, who's going to pay for it? Uh, the Army. If you want to have more satellites so that they can survive when China starts trying to shoot them out of the sky and we still have some left in some future war over Taiwan or the South China Sea, who's going to pay for it? The Army. Since we don't have any money in the federal budget or any tax revenue to generate new programs, uh, many people have started to say that this is what we should do. And I think this is a, a big mistake because the Army, first of all, is already fairly small. Now you might say, well, small compared to what? Because the Army is not an entity unto itself that's there for any reason except to keep us safe. And so you always have to say relative to what mission, relative to what benchmark. Well, I would begin by saying to you, let me give you, a, none of these statistics are conclusive, none of them are, are proof, but the Army today is about 475,000 active duty soldiers headed down to about 450. And the Reserve and National Guard together have about another half million. So if you add it all up, the Army is now dropping below a total of a million soldiers. And that stands in contrast to, let's say, the 1980s, when under Ronald Reagan, uh, the Army was about 800,000 active duty, and so, you know, 40, 50 percent bigger, excuse me, 60 percent bigger uh, than it's now headed towards. You could also say, well, let's measure the Army against other armies around the world. And granted, our Army doesn't fight by itself. And my book is partly about the Marine Corps, too, because as many of you will know, the Marine Corps is sort of another army, but if you said that to a Marine, they'd punch you. And if any of you are Marines, I'm glad you're far enough away that I can now apologize and say the Marines will hasten to add they're also a naval force because they're part of the Department of the Navy. They like to get where they're going by ships, and they consider themselves an expeditionary force. So the Marines are sort of half within my framework and half not. So please forgive me when I often fall back on the language of talking about the Army, uh, even though both services are certainly within my broader framework. And I am talking about the National Guard and Reserve, as well as the active force, whenever I do this. But anyway, if you compare our Army, or even our Army plus Marine Corps, to a number of other countries around the world, we're not number one in size by any means. Chinese Army is much bigger. The Indian and North Korean armies are slightly larger. And uh, partly the reason is we're so far away from all the places we tend to fight that we have a much bigger Air Force and Navy compared to our ground forces. Most countries around the world, three-fourths of their mili military power on average is inside of their ground forces. So um, the world has about 20 million people at arms and about 15 million are soldiers. So three-fourths of the world's military personnel are soldiers, but only about 30 percent of ours. So, uh, that's part of why we're small, but we're also small compared to some of the missions that we might conceivably do, and I want to talk about those in a few minutes, some scenarios that I tried to develop in the book. But you know, armies uh, do have to measure themselves partly against the number of people they might be protecting or helping stabilize or helping provide disaster relief for. A lot of the different missions that armies have done historically have not just been shooting the other country's soldiers but also occupying, stabilizing a certain amount of territory, a certain population base. And so to the extent you want to think about the size of your army, you have to bear in mind the size of the populations of the different parts of the world where you could plausibly operate, including here in the United States. If we had a major disaster of some kind or another, even far beyond 9-11 or Katrina or Sandy, something that really required massive, wide-scale, uh, relief efforts over a sustained period of time. You would want to think about how big is our army even compared to that mission. But I'm thinking primarily about overseas missions. 
Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is the Army's already sort of small and um, it's headed downward. Now there are some proposals to keep cutting it quite a bit. So I'm not making this up. I'm not just trying to create a, a scare mongering um, image that brings you together with me tonight and then make it easy for me to argue against this. There are real important voices out there saying that the Army should be a lot smaller. So again, it was about 800,000 active duty soldiers under Reagan, got cut to around a half million under uh, Clinton stayed there essentially under Bush in the early years, but as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan continued, uh, Bush ultimately built it up a little bit by maybe 15%. So it gets up into the 570,000 range, and now we're down back below Clinton levels already, headed to 450,000 active duty soldiers, which would be substantially less, about 10% less than the typical Bill Clinton levels. And as you know, we are in Washington doing our usual thing of creating a lot of unnecessary drama. And one of the th we're having some nice things in Washington this week. So we have the visit of the Pope. We have uh, the visit of President Xi from China uh, um, after he visits Seattle first. But we also have this silly budget showdown that we're creating yet again for no apparent reason. And uh, it all comes out of the 2011 Budget Control Act, and it gave us sequestration and a shutdown in 2013, and it may give us one or both of those again. And so if we continue on this path under the Budget Control Act, we'll have to keep cutting the defense budget more. And one of the ideas, as I've said, is to have the Army be the principal bill payer so the other services can sustain as much of what they're doing as possible. So one of the ideas that's out there is for the Army to be cut to 380,000 active duty soldiers, which would put us about sixth or seventh in the world and would be about 25% uh, almost below Clinton era levels, about 30% below the peak era under Bush, and less than half of Reagan's level. And um, the, that number, 380,000, came out of a review the Pentagon conducted quietly in the summer of 2013 when they thought that, in fact, uh, a budget shutdown or sequestration might really return in force. As it turned out, we had a short shutdown that year, uh, and then we had the Ryan Murray compromise later that fall, which beefed up the budgets for defense and non-defense for a two-year period. That's coming to an end now. That's why we have another showdown this year. But anyway, when people thought that there might not be a Ryan Murray deal, they did the math and they figured out the Army might need to be cut by yet another 70,000 or so active duty soldiers. So that was one idea that was actively analyzed at the Pentagon. I'm not saying anybody endorsed it, but it was definitely part of the conversation. And if you think that's relatively extreme, and maybe you don't, and I know I'm just throwing some numbers at you to motivate the conversation, because I've got two more myths that I hope together will paint a bigger picture and convince you that there is something to worry about here. But if you don't think the 380 was you know, bad enough, uh, there was a guy who I respect a lot, and maybe you've had him visit here, and you should if you haven't. He's a great American, uh, Admiral Gary Roughhead. He was the chief of naval operations from 2000, um, seven through 2011. He replaced Mike Mullen when Mullen became chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And I think Roughhead was a very good CNO. And I had the pleasure a couple of years ago of being on a task force with him on the US-Australia alliance where he had a lot of brilliant insights. But he also wrote a paper through Brookings, uh, not through my part of Brookings, but uh, through a different part, in which he said the active duty army today should come down to 295,000 soldiers, which would be about a third of the level under Reagan and about half the level under Clinton or Bush. And he basically said, you know, the world is about China's rise and India's rise and globalization and all these new trends in security and rising powers. And the last thing we want to do is waste our national treasure and the lives of our men and women in the sands of places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's a very appealing argument if you sort of think of it historically, looking back on the frustrations we've been through for the last 15 years, and this guy seems to be extricating us once and for all from all these potential frustrations in the future. But the problem is we still have a little problem, you know, a little issue called North Korea that hasn't gone away, and a few other things that I could mention. And I thought Ruff had just sort of swept these concerns aside as one of the smartest members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff I've ever met and a very, very respectable guy. And he was not doing this out of spite for the Army. 
You know, you might, I'm sure a lot of soldiers felt otherwise, because this is a former head of the Navy saying we should cut the army in half. So in terms of parochial, at just the moment when the Navy had beaten army in like 11 straight football games too, just to like pour salt on the wound. So uh, it was not exactly interpreted as a friendly, serious argument, but it, w it was intended to be a, a serious argument. And uh, Roughhead's basically saying, we're, listen, you know, the soldiers should be happy that I'm trying to make the army into something that's not gonna be sent to the next Iraq or Afghanistan. I can't imagine too many soldiers enjoy those experiences, so I'm actually trying to recognize these kind of wars are not good for the nation or for the soldiers of the army, and therefore I'm trying to right-size the army for the kinds of wars we should fight. So anyway, um, what, what I'm trying to do is explain the logic behind Roughhead without agreeing with it, because I think he was forgetting a lot of things that really could happen in the world. The summary of my problem here with myth number one could probably be boiled down to the old Bolshevik adage that I'm sure you've all heard before. Uh, I can't remember the first one who said it, if it was Lenin or, uh, or someone else, but the, the, the line, or Trotsky, but it was, um, you may not have an interest in war, but war may have an interest in you. Which means, of course, none of us want to fight, none of us want to be attacked, none of us want to have some big national, none of us wanted 9-11, none of us wanted some crazy movement in the middle of Afghanistan, half a world away, to come and strike our big cities 15 years, 14 years ago. We didn't want that, and we thought we had the luxury of not worrying about it, and we were wrong. And so whenever we get confident in our crystal balls, we tend to get in trouble. So that's sort of my summary of my problem with, with myth number one. It's cutting the army at a time when it's more out of frustration with the recent past than out of a realistic look at the future. So myth number two, or mistake number two that we're now making, I don't have to go to former heads of the Navy or quietly done Pentagon reviews to articulate this one, I can actually quote official Obama administration policy. And I think official Obama administration policy has made a big mistake on the Army already. Luckily, it hasn't cost us a lot, but intellectually, I think it is fundamentally wrongheaded. And what I'm referring to began with a document that was called the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance. You can find it on the website if you Google it. Um, you can probably, not that I'm encouraging you to read it right now, but you could be done before I'm finished with my talk probably. It's a nice, tight 12-pager, and it's nicely written, and it has some interesting ideas, but one of them uh, was very telling. You know, again, it was released in January 2012. So this is just after President Obama's pulled us out of Iraq, when we're already on the way towards downsizing in Afghanistan. President Obama is gearing up for his re-election race in which he's gonna claim that Al-Qaeda is basically on its heels and that we can now return to a little more normal foreign policy uh, and that he's going to avoid these kinds of wars. And he's changing his, his campaign message a little bit from the first time he ran, which was, I'm not against all wars, I'm just against stupid wars, remember? And he was against Iraq, but he was not against Afghanistan. But by 2012, the message had shifted a bit and we had spent four more years at war, and then President Obama said, I want to end two wars on my watch. I want to be out of both Iraq and Afghanistan by the time I finish my second term. A very noble or desirable sentiment, but of course it didn't wind up playing very well in Iraq, and we're, now we're back, and, uh, and I worry that it could actually hasten our departure prematurely from Afghanistan. We've already downsized by 90% in Afghanistan. That's been okay. President Obama now plans to pull us all the way out of Afghanistan with operational military forces by the end of next year. I hope he rethinks that. I think that would be a mistake. My point, though, is to remind you where we were in 2012. And in 2012, President Obama said to the military leadership, at this time it was still Secretary of Defense Panetta, he said, write a document that tells the military to plan differently. And from now on, we are not going to plan for these messy wars. We're gonna just decide we're not fighting them. Now, I have a, first of all, there's a, a big irony with this and then a big historical warning. The irony is, isn't it, and I'm a Democrat, let me just say, but isn't it sort of um, a, a, a confounding that a Democratic president would decide he's done with nation building, peacekeeping, and stabilization after having done it for four years? Whereas Donald Rumsfeld had the exact opposite trajectory because when George W. Bush ran for president for the first time, 
in 1999-2000. He said, military's not for nation building. Bill Clinton's this woolly-haired liberal and he's sending the forces to Bosnia and Kosovo and I'm gonna have the military do what real warriors are supposed to do, fight and win the nation's wars. Remember there was that line, I think Condi Rice wrote an article in Foreign Affairs that the 82nd Airborne shouldn't be walking kids to their school bus, you know, sort of, um, it was a very funny image, but they really didn't want to do nation building and they were campaigning against it. Four years later, after the, four years after taking office in 2005, under Secretary Rumsfeld, the Pentagon issued a directive, 3000-05, and it said, from here to four, nation building, they didn't use that word, but stabilization and counterinsurgency missions will have an equal priority to classic war fighting. So Rumsfeld and Bush got religion, and Obama started out as this classic Democrat who wanted to stop genocide in Sudan when he was senator, and he wrote articles about that with my good friend Susan Rice, who at that time was my colleague just down the hall at Brookings, and I, I thought they were very intriguing articles. But now, after all the frustrations of these wars, President Obama has shifted. And so by 2012, he's telling the Pentagon, we ain't doing this stuff anymore. You should not build an army that is capable of doing this stuff anymore. Now, the first sentiment I understand, we aren't gonna do this anymore. If what he's expressing is sort of the, the wisdom of a commander in chief who signed way too many condolence letters to families who have lost loved ones in combat, who has seen far too many frustrations in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and really thinks we've got to learn from these kinds of operations not to do it again, or at least not to do it again anytime soon. If that's what he's saying, and he's gonna to try to make his foreign policy decisions accordingly, I get it. And there's probably a lot of wisdom in that. Now he, maybe he took it too far in regard to Syria, as General Petraeus just testified again today. Um, maybe, you know, we were a little too reluctant to get involved in even a limited way. But I understand where Obama's coming from. However, when he starts to tell the Army, do not keep the capabilities to do these messy things, then I think he's making a big mistake. And I'll come back and I'm gonna finish in a few minutes with just listing off some scenarios that I hope can be maybe a basis for conversation, if you like, in our discussion period. But, um, but I think that whenever you believe you've got such a good crystal ball that you can rule things out, you should remember the historical warnings, which I promised. So I think you all know a little bit about our military history, and some of you may have lived it and certainly watched it before. But after World War II, we were done with big wars, right? And so we radically downsized the military. And then five years later, we couldn't even hold off the North Koreans with Task Force Smith in the uh, outbreak of the Korean War. And I know some of you, a couple of you I'm guessing might have uh, been old enough to at least remember some of that or maybe be involved in that. For me, this was historical. I learned about it historically, but when I take myself back to that period, it really is quite stunning to think that, I mean, the U.S. military in 1945, this was the, this, this was the combination of, you know, the New York Yankees of Ruth and Gehrig with the Dallas Cowboys of Troy Aikman and Roger Staubach with, you know, I mean, all, you name your best sports team, we were the best ever in 1945. And in 1950, we couldn't even beat the North Koreans because we had so overlearned the lesson of World War II that we're done with these wars and we're just gonna downsize dramatically. So there we made a huge mistake, we over downsized. And we had other reasons why we got into Korea in a bad way as well, as, as you're aware, but we, we went too far. Then in Vietnam, we, um, we had the same um, American view that, well, what, maybe it was a little different problem, but again, it was a, a reflected a similar dynamic. We're getting our vision or our prognostication of future warfare wrong, really cost us. Because in Vietnam, we went in essentially hoping to treat it like another World War II. Fight it with tanks, fight it with big B-52s, you know, more firepower. And of course, it turned out to be a bad way to fight counterinsurgency. And then so we drew the lesson after Vietnam that you don't do these kinds of wars. The United States just shouldn't be doing counterinsurgency. So what did we do? We prepared just for high-end maneuver warfare. And we were very happy when Operation Desert Storm presented a perfect opportunity for that in 1991. And we continued to leave ourselves unprepared for counterinsurgency. And then, lo and behold, we wound ourselves in not one, but two counterinsurgencies in the 21st century. And no, uh, there may be some people in this room who were against both wars, but most Americans were in favor of at least one of the two. Doesn't mean we were all right, but it does mean that we had this collective decision in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, no more Vietnams, nothing that looks like it. And then most of us decided in retrospect that we actually had to go off and fight at least one more in the 2000s. 
So whenever we come to this great wisdom that we have all of a sudden decided either what the future of warfare is or which wars really matter to our security so that we can decide from the comfort of a nice air-conditioned room in Las Vegas or in Washington which wars we're going to be ready for, I think we're on a dangerous slope. So myth number two is that we can dismiss these really messy conflicts. Myth number three is my last one. It'll be a little bit more inside baseball, so I'll be quick, but a lot of you know that we've had something called a, you know, a two-war capability ever since the end of the Cold War, that first Dick Cheney and Colin Powell, and then under Bill Clinton, and then under Bush, uh, we always had um, some variant uh, as we did our planning to size our forces, to figure out what kinds of capabilities we need. We, we tended to think we needed to be able to fight and win two wars at the same time. Wars like Desert Storm. So Iraq, North Korea, that kind of an adversary. And it turned out we sort of did have to fight two, or at least we chose to fight two in the 21st century. And they were different types of wars than we had anticipated, and we had to build up the military a little further to be able to do it. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, there was some logic to that. And over time, the nature of warfare has shifted, and the character of conflict has shifted. And so now we've gradually sliced away at that requirement. And in the 2014 Pentagon document called the Quadrennial Defense Review, which is a little bit of a boring read, so I'm not necessarily recommending it, but let me summarize for you the key point for this uh, issue tonight, which is that the Quadrennial Defense Review said, we actually don't need to be able to win that second war at the same time any longer. And we, we had sort of been trending in this direction. It wasn't just Obama. I mean, Rumsfeld had been sort of going this way, uh, but not quite as starkly. And then Obama really took it to a larger and longer and more radical extreme. And he said, in that second war that we might have to fight simultaneously, we don't actually need to be able to win it at the same time. We just need to be able to either prevent the enemy from getting their goals, let's say a North Korean takeover of South Korea, or if not that, at least to inflict unacceptable costs on the enemy. Well, I want to submit to you tonight that inflicting unacceptable costs on an enemy is not a viable way to plan American ground forces. It may be, in a worst case, a viable way to do bombing or you know, to plan our nuclear forces, but ground forces are not, don't deploy halfway around the world to go shoot a bunch of people, cause some pain, and then come back. Inflict unacceptable costs. The more I thought about that phrase, the more I've persuaded myself, at least, that we are just headed into a little bit of a surreal direction in how we're thinking about ground forces. So those are my three myths. Myth one, that we can keep cutting. Myth two, that we can stop doing messy stuff. Myth three, that that second war can just be a place where we inflict unacceptable pain or damage on an adversary. And I think these are all misguided intellectually. The good news is we still have an army that retains, by virtue of the legacy of what it's been doing, a lot of capabilities that are no longer required under official policy. So for the moment, we're good. And we're about to have a presidential election where I think most of the candidates are going to be, at least on some issues, a little more hawkish than President Obama, who I think has been a pretty good president. So don't get me wrong. This is not meant to be a broadside against Obama foreign policy writ large. But I think on this idea of getting ourselves out of messy wars and extricating ourselves from two conflicts, Mr. Obama has been almost trying to write his own history book too much. He's been trying to follow an ideology or a dream that I understand why he had that dream, but I'm afraid it's not going to be realistic to get out of these conflicts in the short term, and nor should he be assuming that his successor will be able to stay out of them indefinitely. So put it differently and maybe more happily, sometimes the best way to stay out of these wars is to be well prepared for them in the first place. And we can have a big debate, if you want, in our discussion period as to whether that's true or whether it's better just not to have the capability in the first place. But when I look back at American history, the World Wars, the Korean War, I think more often we've gotten into trouble because we were not prepared, rather than because we were so overprepared that we were just itching to show off our military capability. I really don't think we've done the latter very much. We're not a peaceful or pacifist nation. We do like to exert our leverage, but I don't think we go looking for big wars to fight. Uh, and even George W. Bush, who was sometimes criticized for being unilateralist, I think he felt powerfully that Saddam Hussein was a threat and that he needed to go after him. I you know, don't agree with how the Bush administration handled that policy. My point, however, is not to debate each and every conflict. It's to make the general argument that I think we're better off being prepared 
anticipating where we might have to fight and being ready, and therefore hopefully shoring up our deterrent rather than learning too late that our crystal ball was wrong again. And now we're going to have to go build up capabilities that we deliberately cast aside because of some mistaken view of what the future of war would be. So that's the broad argument. I think I'm going to stop there and look forward to your discussion. I do have a lot of scenarios in the book that I'm happy to get into, if you wish, that try to explain why I think that, unfortunately, large-scale military operations on land may still be in our future, whether we like it or not. And I try to work through a number of those, having made this broader theoretical argument. But I think I'll stop there and look forward to, to your thoughts and reactions, recognizing that some of you may want to disagree fundamentally with me. And if that's the case, please do, because obviously we've got a big decision to make here as a nation. I think this issue actually will interject itself a fair amount into the presidential campaign. Uh, asterisk footnote, Carly Fiorina started the conversation last week. She did actually have some recommendations on the Marine Corps and Army. Uh, and we'll see, um, uh, Donald Trump wasn't quite as specific. So, um, so I, it's, it's probably gonna be an uneven pacing as to who gets into this in detail when, but, but I think we'll hear a lot more about it. So I look forward to getting your thoughts as well. Thanks. Well, before I turn to you, I, you sort of answered my question, Michael, which was, how much do you think this topic will be, since we're in a political season, will be part of either party's primary? Will it be more or less a part of the final election? It's an interesting question. You know, if, um, in the book, I don't, try to, I don't try to dwell too much on the near-term crises and conflicts. I actually do think we're going to have to do substantially more in Syria. Lindsey Graham's been trying to say that, and he can't even get onto the debate stage. And that's too bad because he's a fine American and a bright guy on these issues. So I'm not sure that talking about trying to link a case for the size of the army to any immediate issue that's on Americans' TV screens is going to be very appealing. Uh, however, I do think that some people will want to say, you know what, um, look at the Chinese. Uh, they're rising. They're trying to flex their muscles a little bit more. But they seem pretty smart. They, they don't seem crazy. And if we're firm in response, if, if we stand up to them in response, we can sort of guide their rise and convince them not to challenge the existing order too much. And I think that argument may play. Now that argument tends to lead you more towards building up the Navy than towards the Army. But of course, we're a multi-spectrum joint force. And, um, and also we do have, you know, other, uh, one, more, one more place where a candidate could plausibly criticize Obama and you know, want to do something differently would be if Obama really does take us all the way out of Afghanistan or virtually all the way out. You could imagine a lot of candidates saying, you know what, we worked way too hard to get to where we are in Afghanistan to give up the counterterrorism bases, the commando bases, the drone bases that President Obama is now relinquishing. And as soon as I'm in the White House, I'm going to try to build up those capabilities again. And that's going to require some limited number of soldiers. In other words, people aren't going to want to debate it the way I did in the book, like what's the future of land warfare in 2025. I don't think that's going to be a presidential uh, level election issue. But if they can link it to a current crisis, or if they can link it to their indictment of President Obama, especially if they're Republican, then I think it could play. Who'd like to start? Sure. About the difference between the capability of acting and the actual action itself. Uh, you mentioned different scenarios of how it was in the past compared to today, but viewing how the foreign policy today is conducted, how the United States is more supporting the countries in order for the other countries to do the dirty work for the United States, uh, what makes it so inherently bad that the United States decreases their military in order to have more funding to give to the countries. For example, we've seen it with the Kurds, with ISIS, even the Turkish. Now, I agree with you in examples like Syria where the situation is too thick for us to trust uh, different rebels. But, and knowing the scenario now about how the status quo is changing, why are foot soldiers so important when we have cooperation with so many other countries who are more than willing to do the work? Well, it's a good question. First of all, I think we need more security assistance, too. <laughs> so um, I'd rather not think of these as pitting one against the other. In some sense, of course, budgeting does require you to establish priorities. But I think, as you well know, 
Defense budget, this is in the 550 billion a year range. Security assistance budget is in the 30 to 40 billion a year range. We can make some substantial increases in the security assistance budget at a much lower level of effort. And so um, I don't, you know, there was some flexibility in the latter Bush and Obama years to be able to transfer some DOD funds over to security assistance at the discretion of the Secretary of Defense and State. And so there are times where you do make these sort of zero-sum trade-offs, but I don't think we should begin with looking at it that way. I think we should say, what's the requirement? Now, that'd be point one. Point two, uh, you know, the Kurds and the Turks have helped a little. <laughs> ISIS is still um, a lot more powerful than I'd like. My um, former classmate and occasional co-author, Dave Petraeus, testified today before the Senate Armed Services Committee and basically, in a nonpartisan way, indicted the situation in the campaign against ISIL. And he said, we've got a few fundamentals in the right uh, place, but a lot of our implementation is very weak, under-resourced, and in some cases even misconstrued. So I think we're relying too much on partners. The Afghans, you know, I've been to Afghanistan a lot, and uh, I've never fought there, and so my hat's off to those who have fought and done development work and done diplomacy, and a lot of the other you know, great efforts that Americans and others have put in there in the last 15 years. And I've been over a lot to study and to assess what was going on. And the Afghan security forces have come an incredibly long ways, incredibly long. And they're doing something like 98% of all the fighting now, depending on how you measure. But uh, we had General Campbell at Brookings. He's the head of the Afghanistan mission today for NATO and for the United States. But the real head is the Afghan government because they're doing the overwhelming fraction of the fighting. And so we've already succeeded in transferring most of the burden to this force that we helped create and train and equip. And now the question is, do we leave entirely and leave them on their own entirely, or do we keep a few thousand Americans there to help them and give them some confidence and also do the occasional commando raid that we may need to do for our own security against Al-Qaeda or ISIL? So I, I don't want to put it in either or terms. It's not either defense or security assistance. It's not either the allies do it or we do it. But generally speaking, if you look around the world, and if you get into a big crisis or conflict, generally speaking, local actors do not have the capacity without our help. If you're talking about some of the bigger scenarios that I look at in the book, and even, let me give one example. Um, anybody who's studying ground forces in the year 2015 has to look at Korea. Because even though uh, the DMZ is extremely fortified, despite its name, and, and certainly the area around it, incredibly fortified, and, uh, and even though the South Koreans have, I think, the 10th biggest GDP in the world, and they spend 2.5% of their GDP on their military, which is a pretty respectable amount, and, uh, and even though I think they could, pound per pound, soldier for soldier, uh, kick the butts of the North Koreans, if that war were to break out again, or even if there were a North Korean state collapse, I think we need to be very involved very early. For one thing, the North Koreans probably have at least a dozen nuclear weapons. They also have several hundred artillery tubes within range of Seoul. And if this conflict begins, there's going to be a huge premium on ending it very fast and on silencing these long-range artillery and missile launchers, finding the nuclear weapons before they can leak out or be used. And that's going to require a lot of American help. The South Koreans are darn good, but this problem, if it, if it were to happen, would be, in many ways, the worst problem we'd ever seen in warfare because of the 10 or 12 nuclear weapons. And by the way, the North Koreans are so indoctrinated that I think that they're going to fight for Kim Jong-un the same way the Saddam Fedayeen fought for him. And it's going to be, but it's going to be hundreds of thousands of North Korean soldiers in this case. So if you look around the world at the requirements of deterrence, even if our allies are doing more and doing quite a bit in some cases, uh, Quite often, if you look at the scenario that you have to worry about in any kind of detail, it's going to require a combined effort with American forces being the only real plausible outside help. Mark? Do you see NATO as really still a strong ally in confronting the problems uh, in Eastern Europe in particular? Thanks for the question, and that's a nice natural follow-on since I was just talking about Korea. You probably noticed I didn't choose a NATO example <laughs> as my first. Um, well, first of all, let me give credit where credit's due, and my guess is that you've tracked this issue quite a bit through your life as well. If you look at, let's say, the Afghanistan mission, 
Afghanistan was the perfect example of why NATO is a mess and yet we never want to be without NATO, <laughs> right? Because at the peak of the surge, this, and let's remember, okay, so Barack Obama comes in, he's trying to rebuild all these diplomatic bridges. He's trying to, to repair the damage, I'm just following his narrative, that President Bush had done to our standing and our stature around the world with friends, allies, and neutrals. And Obama was incredibly popular in Europe. In fact, it's the only continent where he really is still incredibly popular relative to his predecessors. He's still doing okay in the United States, and he's still sort of about as popular in Asia and South America as Bush. But Europe's the only place where he actually is still substantially more popular than Bush had been. So the Europeans love him, that's what I'm trying to say. But even the, the Obama-loving Europeans, when they were presented with an opportunity to really help Obama, they found the um, collective wherewithal to add about 7,000 troops to their Afghanistan presence back in 2009, 2010, while we added 70,000. So we started at 30,000. President Bush was already modestly increasing that number as he left office. President Obama had the first big review and got, up, got the number up to 68,000, had the second big review under McChrystal and got the number up to 100,000. Throughout this whole process, the Europeans went from a collective total of about 30,000 to 37,000. So that both goes to show that even when they're enthusiastic about helping the great Obama re restore the world the way it's supposed to be, uh, with America leading but Europe following um, in cases where we all agree on the mission, all they could collectively do with a combined population greater than ours, with a combined size of their aggregate military greater than ours, they could only find 7,000 people. On the other hand, the NATO mission in Afghanistan was the largest, basically, in the history of warfare in terms of the number of coalition partners, about 50 at a time, all of, basically all of NATO plus the Australians and a few others. And, um, and we did have a total of about 40,000 other troops from countries all over the world to add to our 100,000. And some of them were quite good. Some of them were more mixed. But I had the opportunity to go visit the Germans up in uh, North Afghanistan a couple of times. And frankly, I was stunned that a country that had, you know, had the history of Germany and that had such a strong tradition of non-intervention in the whole Cold War was willing to sustain 5,000 soldiers in a mission where it lost 40 people killed in action in the course of the Afghanistan war and did not waver. And this was the same Germany that, of course, had had the big fight with President Bush over Iraq. But when they agreed with us on something, they were prepared to sustain 5,000 troops for many years. So I'd much rather have that than not. Now, you asked about Europe, and, um, and I'm, I'm assuming you're thinking about Ukraine and areas like that. Poland. And Poland, yeah. And um, well, Poland's, yeah, good, okay. Uh, so let's divide it into two categories. On Ukraine, um, and apologies to Ukrainians in the room, um, I think we need to carry a, carry a, care a lot about Ukraine's security. I don't think we should be devoting American soldiers and lives to the defense of a country that's not in NATO and uh, a country where Putin, frankly, cares more. So I just don't think it's sustainable to do a fundamentally different strategy from what we're doing. And I would increase the sanctions if the war continues, but I would not uh, have the American military pledge any support. We can have a debate about whether we should arm the Ukrainian military itself or not, but whereas Poland or the Baltic states, because they're in NATO, I don't think we have any choice. We have to defend them. And, um, and I say this, by the way, as a person who wasn't that enthusiastic about expanding NATO in the first place, but now that we've done it, there can be no slippage. There can be no daylight in terms of our commitment to those countries. So I share some of your concern because I don't see the Europeans doing quite enough to help us in terms of defense of the Baltic and Polish regions. And uh, especially if the Ukraine crisis continues, I would hope we would see that because I think we probably want to make our commitment to the Baltics and Poland even more unambiguous. As you know, we've been moving in that direction. We're doing a lot of exercises. We're stationing a little bit of equipment there. I don't believe we should put a lot of equipment there, but I think a steady American presence with some Europeans along with us all the time would probably be a smart tripwire capability so Putin doesn't get the wrong idea. So I'm coming around to say I wish the Europeans would do a bit more, but they're still the best allies on the planet in many ways. And having NATO is far better than not having it, in my eyes.
Do you want to comment? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Another, just to follow up on it, our grandson is a cadet at the Air Force Academy, and uh, he was in Poland this uh, summer on a, uh, a study type of mission. Uh, West Point and Annapolis were involved, and a couple of liberal arts schools were even involved. And he came back with one report, and that is that the people that they spoke with in the government, in the military, and even in our embassy were so highly concerned over a fear of the lack of support from the administration for Poland in its present situation. And I don't see any support coming from the other European countries uh, either. So that I, I actually began to wonder about the, the uh, viability of NATO itself as this ally that we need. Well, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to defend everything about the European response, but I do think that, there, first of all, there are a lot of Poles who, uh, and I think Carly Fina Arena got at this too um, the other day, who still feel that Bush was more their friend than Obama. There is an element almost of our partisan debates getting that far into Poland in particular, I think. Uh, they've sensed it. Second, you could understand why they'd have some concerns given where they live. Uh, but third, I also think that, um, and I've seen some polling, the Pew Charitable Trust did a poll this spring in which a number of European publics weren't so sure that they would want to fight for the defense of Poland or any other NATO member if it came to that. And some people said, oh, this is terrible. This shows that the alliance is forgetting its real purpose. The Article 5 uh, commitments, you know, attack on one is an attack on all. Uh, are being ignored or, or just deliberately trivialized. And that was one interpretation. But other people said, you know what? It's also possible that the European publics just don't really think that's what Putin's all about. He's not, he's a bad guy and he's gonna stow, stoke up conflict where he can, but he's not gonna be so de deliberately stupid or suicidal as to come right into our wheelhouse. And so, I'm not defending the European publics. I think it's better to make sure Putin doesn't get the wrong idea with some very clear commitments. But I think that most uh, European publics uh, are a little bit more dubious that that's the kind of threat we're going to see. And the, the main proof would be that they are overwhelmingly still in favor of sanctions. They do want to punish Putin for what he's doing in Ukraine. They don't have any illusions about what he's like. But they just think the line is already pretty clear on NATO. I think you and I would like to make it even more clear. But I think that's one possible interpretation. And by the way, if Putin did attack Poland, I'm pretty convinced all of Europe is going to come down on him like a ton of bricks, including with military force. I really, I mean, I, you know, Europeans are a little more reluctant than we are to, to use force. But if somebody actually attacked NATO, I think they would, we, we don't want them to have to learn after the fact that it was a mistake. So I'd rather shore up the deterrence now, just like you and your grandson uh, and the Poles. But, um, but I think Putin actually, it, even though he's a, bad guy. He's a smart enough guy to know that messing with Article 5 is a pretty risky proposition. I hope we don't find out to the contrary. I have two concerns or two questions. How can a U.S. land force fight in the non-traditional wars <clears throat> in the Middle East where I don't really see anybody there of whether it's Shia or Sunni as really our allies and then I see the second portion is <clears throat> we fought so hard in Iraq, and then we have Maliki, who really contravened everything that we tried to do, and now Iraq is in a mess. Yeah. Well, I think there are, there are, there are a few things to say. One is, I think you and I and most Americans would agree, the amount of investment compared to the amount of payoff was out of kilter. And we're not going to do that again at that scale. That'd be point one. But point two, we, we then tried the alternative approach, which was to do next to nothing in Syria. And even though we didn't lose 5,000 of our fellow Americans or spend a trillion bucks, we've now got the conflict nowhere near burning out. And a number of other regional states are at risk. And we've got the potential of Charlie Hebdo attacks you know, throughout the West and a lot of Syrian suffering. It's almost a slow motion genocide at this point. So I think our 
Syria policy has fundamentally failed, and the only thing worse than our Syria policy, perhaps, was our Iraq policy. But uh, because in Iraq we also had a failure, but we lost 5,000 lives. Having said that, I actually think we can salvage the Iraq part because the body's much better than Maliki. And I think we're going to have to beef up our support for him the way General Petraeus testified today. There are a number of specific things we can do. And I think we should try to promote the formation of an Iraqi National Guard so the Sunnis can fight for their Sunni regions, the Shia can fight for their Shia regions, Kurds the same. They already have, as you know, their, their own force up north. And then you have a small integrated professional army that essentially is multi-confessional. Because I think that's probably the best you can do at this point. Iraq is so torn apart that a country that used to have Sunni, Shia, Kurds, even Jews and Christians living together reasonably well for many centuries has been ripped apart to the point where that's no longer credible. But it was possible. Iraqis are not somehow born with genetic composition that makes them incapable of cooperating or living across sectarian lines. But at this point, some kind of a, of a looser confederal structure for Iraq I think is the more realistic path. But you know, the way you put the question is, can we just sort of, can we do anything at all constructive? And I think, you know, the success of the surge, the success for the period of several years suggests that, yes, we can. And we may not have the alternative of just washing our hands of the problem. I consider the Syria problem to be getting worse every year. And now our European friends are finding out the hard way. It's right in their face through refugee flows. At least the three Americans stopped the train attack. So we didn't have another Charlie Hebdo or worse. But now they have hundreds of thousands of refugees. You know, this problem is getting worse every year. So we've got to basically agree, I think, that the big invasions don't work, but doing nothing doesn't work. And we've got to start getting clever about the middle range. And, um, you know, I think I've been trying to develop an idea on Syria that would involve us trying to help create pockets of resistance on the ground in Syria. And once they're slightly established, and Petraeus said the same kind of thing today in his testimony, we should be willing to use American air power to help protect them, and we should be willing to send American trainers into the territories to increase the size of these moderate opposition groups, and then gradually empower them to have more of a role in the future of Syria. I don't think we have any choice, because letting this thing burn is not working either. How can you identify the moderate groups? Because you have such, such a flux, whether it's Al-Qaeda uh, or Hezbollah, or, 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 and, and now we're somewhat allied with, with uh, Iran, yeah. And then we're fighting against Iran down in, in Yemen. It, it, it seems so difficult to identify somebody that's a moderate. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? And how do the land forces, are they involved there? Can they be involved? Can they be effective? Well, yeah, to bring that, so let me start with that. To bring it back to my main topic of the book talk, uh, I would not propose that we do heavy duty fighting in Syria. I want to do a lot of things with air power and special forces to empower these moderate forces. And I'll come back to that part of your question. That's the most fundamental part. And then work towards a peace deal, which is a confederal Syria, like a Bosnia model, maybe even a looser confederation than Bosnia. And at that point, I think there'd have to be an international peace implementation force. So that's the role I see for American ground forces down the path. And I don't like the idea probably any more than you do, but I just don't see the alternative of trying to work towards some, that, to me that's the minimal uh, standard for a stable Syria that's consistent with our interests. We're nowhere near that kind of a Syria right now. So it gets back to your first question. How do you create a moderate opposition? Well, you start by working with the ones who already are moderate, like the Kurds. And we've been skittish about that, but we've been okay. Second, you stop, when you do these vetting exams with people, you stop making them promise never to fight Assad. Do you know that that's what we've been doing? We actually try to recruit people from these different tribes in Syria, and most of them are Sunni. Going back to your earlier point, most of them do want to fight Assad because he is the Alawite, the Shia, who's been barrel bombing their people. And there is a real animus, obviously, and a desire for revenge. And what do we do in the vetting process? We make them swear on a stack of Korans that they are not going to fight Assad with any of the weapons we're providing. This is crazy. It's crazy. Because Assad's killed four-fifths of all the dead people in Syria in the last four years. And these people are motivated to fight because of their animus against Assad. And then we wonder why once we refuse them any help, they go cooperate with al-Nusra or ISIL. We're giving them nowhere else to turn. So we've got to change the vetting standards and we've got to stop asking these silly 
questions about which, enemy, which devil do you hate worst? And if you don't give us the right answer, you can't have our help. We've been doing this consciously, and I'm convinced it's been partly Machiavellian to minimize the number of recruits that we can find. So then we can have a self-reinforcing answer, which is there aren't any moderates, so don't blame us for not creating or finding them. So the, the beginning of the answer to your question is you start really trying, and then you see where you are in six months. We haven't even tried yet. It seems like there's such a naivete. Uh, everything is so black and white, and it's not black and white over there. Um, and Everything, it, it seems very misguided, so many of these policies. No recognition of, of different cultures and whatever is going on over there. Well, I know there's a couple other questions, and, a, and we're almost out of time. But let me say one thing, because I, I came out pretty hard against our policy on Syria. Let me say the logic of our basic approach in Iraq, I think, has been correct, but the implementation has been very, very lukewarm or, 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 or tepid or weak. Because the logic was, first of all, get rid of Maliki or persuade the Iraqis to get rid of Maliki. We didn't do an old-fashioned coup. We persuaded them, and they did it last year. Second, help the Kurds fend off the uh, ISIL attack on Kurdistan in Iraq. Third, tolerate temporarily the use of Shia militias by the government to protect Baghdad, because the fall of Baghdad would have been even worse than seeing Iranian-backed Shia militias have some role in its defense. And then fourth, start to use American air power selectively. And then fifth, try to start training up the Iraqi army and police again. All those pieces were very solid. And I think through last fall, we had a good start on Iraq. And then we plateaued. And we haven't done the next five things of that same general ilk. Um, so I, I want to give President Obama a lot of credit on Iraq. The logic was good, but the implementation has really stalled. Up here, please. Sir. Can you tell me, do you feel that the Obama administration has misspent the peacetime dividend that uh, we may have gained in the last decade, or was there not one after this war? Or would you uh, argue against the idea of a, of a dividend at all? Well, I'm in favor of where we are with the size of the military budget and with the Army budget in particular. I'm against the sequestration level additional cuts. And the, uh, at, th at this point, I think we need some small, uh, real increases above the inflation rate going forward. But I think the general thrust of Obama policy on the size and structure of the military has been fine, and frankly, not radically different from Bush. We've actually had a fair amount of consensus about the size and shape and budget of the post-Cold War American military. So like I said earlier, I'm sort of arguing almost against the hypothetical of if you really believe these ideas that are out there now, Admiral Roughhead saying cut the army in half, President Obama saying we're not going to do messy stuff anymore, uh, the Pentagon saying we're not going to have a second war capability except to inflict pain. Uh, if, you, if you really follow through on the logic of that, you can get yourself in some serious trouble. But I still think we can right ourselves in the course of the next couple of years, and the damage won't be that strong. In terms of President Obama's overall national security policy, I actually think it's been substantially better than on the issues we've been focusing most of our discussion on tonight. So I believe the rebalance to the Asia Pacific has been pretty well construed and executed. A little bit of, a little bit of um, lack of energy in the second term when we had Secretary Clinton and others leave the team and the successors didn't quite sustain as much energy on the rebalance, but President Obama himself did. And President Xi coming to Washington this week is one more element of it, because the rebalance is not against China. It's in favor of restoring our influence in the broader region, sometimes working with allies, sometimes even working with China. So I think that part's been good. I think President Obama's restraint in handling Ukraine, the Ukraine crisis, has actually been pretty good, even though I share the concern. I'd like to see our deterrence in the Baltic states perhaps increased a little bit more. But I think the idea of not turning Ukraine into a military battleground against Russia was smart and showed some good restraint. We all have our views about the Iran nuclear deal. I don't think it was all that well negotiated, but I still support it at the margin. And so, um, and on Afghanistan, uh, if President Obama changes his policy and decides to keep a few thousand troops, then I'll be pretty happy with his overall Afghanistan policy. So I don't want to say he squandered any, you know, um, military capability by the United States. I don't want to say he's had a weak national security record, but I do see some thinking creeping into our broader debate about the role of land forces that I would like to challenge. Thank you. Last question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, oh, go ahead. 
an assumption that I think we're making as a whole is that, I le and I, I'm not sure if you mentioned this more in your uh, book, is that most of what we're talking about is the buildup of the military in order to sustain our already controlled, or at least countries that we already uh, have some sort of foot in. When it comes to countries like China and Russia though, historically what we've seen is that a beef up of the military is re reciprocated by the countries who have the capabilities to do so. So there's two possible outcomes that can happen. The first is that it leads to an infinite digress of continuation of military buildup, or the second is that we lead into a trilateral hegemonic cold war where we allow Russia to take some countries, we allow China to have control of some regions and the United States have control of other regions. So in terms of your book and your opinions, how is the U.S. military buildup going to lead uh, in terms of either stopping an infinite digress or stopping a trilateral hegemonic Cold War? Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a good big picture question to finish on. Um, let me say a few things. First of all, I would, I, I, I take very seriously the concerns you've got on the table. I would not overstate either Russian or Chinese capabilities vis-a-vis -vis us right now. Not only do we have far and away the largest defense budget, we also have far and away the greatest modern inventory of modern weaponry because China's been catching up in the defense budget, but we still outspend them three to one. And we used to outspend them 10 to one, 20 to one, and we were investing all through that period. And so we have a lot of stuff. The book I did last year with Jim Steinberg on the US-China relationship, we calculated the United States by our, by our definition had something like three trillion dollars worth of inventory of modern weaponry as we defined it. And China probably had about 150 billion. So it was like a 20 to one, or at least a 15 to one advantage. Um, so that would be point one. But point two, uh, it's not all about the dollars and the rubles and the RMB. And, and I think you're right to raise some of these concerns. I would say that uh, the book I did with Steinberg, we were actually concerned about the dynamic in the US-China relationship. And we were trying to propose ways in which both sides could be committed to their own core values, principles, and interests, and yet try to take an edge off the competitive dynamic. And that's what I had the chance to speak about here last time I was here. Uh, maybe we can speak afterwards with some of the details on that, because I share your concern that there is the potential here for essentially an arms race that you don't know how to easily control. And you've got to look for, it's hard to um, stop that when we don't want to pull back, and nor should we pull back from the defense of our allies in the region. And yet China wants to exercise more influence in that very region. And its relations with some of our allies are poor. So it's complicated. And um, I'll give you just one very small example on the South China Sea. Uh, I, I think this whole issue of them reclaiming islands and putting military assets on the islands uh, and then claiming almost all the South China Sea for themselves, we have to be very nuanced in how we respond. Because when they claim the whole South China Sea for themselves, to me, that's ridiculous. And we have to be adamant we're going to keep sailing through. And they can't start you know, shooting up the boats of other countries. And we'll be pretty resolute about that. On the other hand, if they reclaim a few sandbars and even put a couple of squadrons of fighter jets on those, I don't like that, but I'm an American. Of course I don't like that. But I see it as sort of the equivalent of us sailing an aircraft carrier through, in a way. I mean, we put our aircraft carriers, you know, they're mobile and they've got nuclear reactors and they move. China's aircraft carriers in the South China Sea are made out of sand and they're stationary. And as long as they're relatively transparent in how they do this and uh, they don't get into a huge arms race of their own making, I think we should tolerate a certain amount of it. Partly because we have no choice and no good answers apart from getting into the dynamic that you just mentioned. And that's, I guess, implicitly the answer to your last part of your question, which is, no, I'm not interested in carving up the world. Um, I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that in a place like the Ukraine crisis, not just Putin, who's a jerk, and I'm not trying to make Putin happy with anything I say, but a lot of other Russians actually do think that NATO was sort of abusive of their interests after the Cold War. They do think of NATO expansion as being, if nothing else, psychologically threatening or insulting. Maybe some of them actually think it's militarily threatening because they're listening to Putin's nonsense and the public uh, relations that he does. And they actually worry that you know, a few Air Force cadets on a trip to Poland is like a major threat. I mean, they, they, they literally do. They'll say these rotations of 20 American trainers or 50 American infantry soldiers are a, a threat 
So the, the Russian media is out of control. I do a lot of Russian media. You've got to be really careful when you do it because some of them will be fair to you. A lot of them will just try to twist your words because they're essentially working for Putin, Inc. So, so Russia's um, a place where free speech and democracy are at serious risk, if not already gone for the moment. But, um, but having said that, a lot of Russians built up this animosity against NATO. And it was probably misguided. It was probably unfair. They didn't realize we were trying to help a lot of countries just stabilize their own you know, internal governance. And the Russians portrayed it to themselves as a big threat. But that is how they have come to believe it. I think it's sincere for most of them. It's not just something they say to make us angry or to get us to back away. So that's why I'm in favor of a new Central European security architecture, not to eliminate NATO, but to stop expanding it eastward and to create a, a, a zone that's sort of akin to Austria or Switzerland or Finland, where um, Russia and NATO co-guarantee the sovereignty of this region and agree not to extend military alliances into it. So anyway, as you can see, I share some of your concerns. You may or may not like any of my answers, but I'm trying to wrestle with the same kind of questions. Let me thank all of you for the great questions. Absolutely. And for coming out tonight. Thank you, sir, for another great talk. My pleasure. Uh, I want to get you out of here on time, but we'll stay around if you have other questions and want to follow up. Uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks. October 7th, I think, is a Wednesday. We'll keep this sort of global theme. We'll have uh, a colleague, Josh Meltzer, out from Brookings, and he'll be looking at uh, climate change and global development and talking about some of the uh, negotiations going on on a multinational level. So I hope you can join us in a couple weeks. See y'all. Thanks.